one of those days when Jesus walks into the temple in Jerusalem to the adoration of many in the crowd, and of course to the scorn of both the religious teachers and the Pharisees who are trying to protect power, trying to oppress people, and trying to make sure that all scriptural interpretation bends towards that aim. Jesus sits down to teach, having done it before, and it's why the writer tells us that he is teaching again. We know why he's continuing to teach and why he is admired while doing so, because scripture says the people heard him gladly. And just as Jesus is finishing up his teaching, he notices that some teachers of the law and some Pharisees are pressing towards him. They are encircling this woman pushing her along in front of them, and you can sense her shame from a mile away. What in the world could this woman have done, and what in the world are they forcing her along like this for? We're told, just a little after their exchange with Jesus, that it is an attempt really not to present her, but to trap Jesus. So they solicit his opinion on the matter. They didn't need to push the woman in front of him like this, if they had intentions to judge and to punish her, they didn't need Jesus' input to make that decision. But it was for them a good opportunity, so they thought, to get him tangled up in the cross-weaving of his teaching and his ethics and what they thought was contradictory based on how they interpreted the law of Moses. They place her right in front of Jesus. They close ranks around her, which means now they are circling both Jesus and the woman, these teachers of the law, these Pharisees. What an intimidating scene, right? They had pre-selected who would be the spokesperson, and he wasted no time. Teacher, this woman here has been caught in the act of committing adultery. And in the law of Moses, of course, as you know, Moses commanded us to stone a woman like this. But what do you say? And of course, they are partially correct about the law's directives, even though they have only dragged one of the offenders before Jesus. The small omission, or maybe they didn't care that the rest of that directive calls for both people to be presented, to be accused, and to be sentenced. Did at least two of these teachers of the law observe the act because that would have been necessary? Or could they testify that she had been violated? If they were close enough to catch them, had they attempted to prevent them from engaging in the act in the first place? And since Moses never really mentioned anything about the punishment being stoning to death specifically, that would have to have been discussed among these accusers and they couldn't make that decision among themselves. That decision rested with the Roman governor and not simply the Jewish leaders. This is a bad scene for Jesus. Because all of this mishandling of the precious gift of human life in this woman, even though it appears she is guilty of what they are accusing her of, it is obvious to Jesus that it is less about her and more about him. They are trying to trap him. And so he pauses, he considers, he ponders, and then he stoops to the ground. He starts writing in the sand. Matters not what he is writing. What matters is the leaders encircling him want an answer. So they keep pushing Jesus for an answer. Teacher, what do you say? And Jesus says, as a way of protecting the law, of sparing the woman, of exposing the motives of the men, he stands and he says, if any one of you who is without sin feel free to cast the first stone. The boldness and the strong intention these men each possess when pushing this woman to Jesus and subsequently pushing Jesus into this whole nonsensical drama. Now, these men are sobering up from being drunk on hate. And stones start dropping. And these men each start walking away until when the circle dissipates, Jesus and the woman are there alone, and he says, where are those that would condemn you? She looks around and says, sir, there are none. He says, well, I don't condemn you either. For the act, they say they caught you committing, I don't condemn you. But I'm going to encourage you 
Get up from here and go live your life without the weight of this sin on your life. Let that kind of life go. And like that, this woman pushed to Jesus by hate is persuaded to go now and try life forgiven and pardoned and set free. The tension in this text for me is not the men pushing the woman right in front of Jesus. The tension in the text to me is not the intimidation of encircling Jesus in expert misunderstanding and interpretation of Moses' law. It's not the force of the question, this is what Moses said, but what do you say? It's not the stooping and writing or the stones being dropped one by one. It is not the men each walking away from the oldest to the youngest. The tension and the power in this text, to me, is what Jesus decides to do with his authority. Not one of these men could condemn this woman. They could only testify to what they have observed, what they have perhaps been attempted to prevent. The Roman governor had not been appealed to for ruling regarding this woman and what she's accused of. But when those men drop those stones and walk away and Jesus is now standing in front of a woman who must be guilty by what Jesus says to her, he alone has the authority to judge her. He could call for her to be stoned or killed by any other methodology because he has the authority to judge sin since he is God. And what does he decide to do with his authority? He decides rather than to condemn her, I'm going to pardon her. He gifts her with a chance to live past this moment and to push her life in a different direction, to make some different life-changing decisions, to be better to herself and to manage other people a whole lot better. He blesses her to turn the page on the chapters of her narrative. And however it read before, the first sentence of the next page says, the day life took a right turn. How the rest of her life had to be lived differently because of the one encircled tense moment when my life was hanging in the balance and when I was convinced that I was about to be stoned. Minutes later, I'm walking away because of one man's confidence that I can live my life better than I have been living it to date. This text is about what Jesus does with his authority. That's the power of this story, Ararat. It turns out, that the only one who really possessed authority to determine this woman's fate was Jesus. And what does he do with it? He doesn't annul its force. He doesn't determine that he's going to destroy the law. Remember, he even intimated he didn't come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. So he doesn't annul its force. He honors it. A judgment has to be rendered. Her act has to be addressed. She has to deal with the consequences of her actions. But Jesus doesn't annul its force. He just alters its verdict. He, in essence, says to the brethren, I know what y'all wanted to do. Y'all showed up with stones because you intended to kill her. And by killing her, you intended to kill me. But ain't nobody dying out here today. She won't die. She's going to live. She won't be condemned. She's going to be commissioned. She won't be stoned. She's going to be saved. He protects the law's definition of condemnation. He stewards his own authority to release it, and he decides to give her mercy. I need to say it one more time. It is the transition. He protects the law's definition of condemnation. He stewards his own authority to release it, and he decides to give her mercy. The same way Jesus stewards the authority that he singularly possessed is the same way I want you to steward the decisions in your own life so that you're not making decisions in your life because of the intimidating encircling presence of influence and pressures. Is anybody listening to me in here? The demands and deadlines that are pressing you for answers and actions that you weren't even expecting to have to offer. The hard decisions that come when you hear the diagnosis and it almost sends you into despondency. The surprise discoveries that you know are going to alter everything about the rest of your life. Those critical heart and love issues and decisions that can mean the difference between lifelong connections and severing relationships that were God intended if only for a season. The spiritual 
discipline of stewarding the authority that God gives to every one of us. This stretches all the way from what to do in Afghanistan. And it crosses all the way over to the deeply personal decisions that will impact every one of our individual lives. President Joseph Biden stepped into the encircled experts who for 20 years have been interpreting the law and leaving parts out. He makes a decision that has caused so much angst in the country about a country that last week not many Americans were even thinking about. Both sides of the political aisle are like sharks in infested blood water trying to take advantage of the political capital assumed to be gained from the debate and the discussion. That is just a matter within the border of political authority. But you and I live every day with spiritual authority, don't we? And what impact that has on our decisions and considerations. And Jesus is teaching in the text that authority must be stewarded intentionally. Now, hear me well. You can respond to life in any kind of way you want, but this text teaches us that God expects you to respond to life's events in a spiritually specific way. You can interact with other people and respond to an individual in a certain tone and with certain substance. You can give them a piece of your mind. You can curse them out because you've grown. you got the right to do whatever you want to do, but God expects that the spirit that lives in you would have such an impact on you that it will guard your tongue. Are y'all talking to me in here? It'll change and alter and transform your actions that will reveal that you are attempting to steward faithfully the authority that the Lord has given to you. What have you done with that which exists in the center of this encircled experience that has you in the middle of it? How quick or emotional have some of your decisions been? Instead of thinking about them thoroughly and talking to the Lord, you reacted to the things that were presented to you. And then you look back in the rearview mirror and carry some regrets that had you just calmed down. Y'all, y'all, are you mad at me? Did I do something to y'all? Okay, you don't like the sermon? The introduction was too long. You want me to get to the conclusion? Okay, can you talk to me? All right, how quick or oh, emotional have some of your decisions been perhaps not thoroughly thought out? How influenced are you by the partial correctness of people around you who are panicking and pushing you for an answer? How thoughtful are you being about the critical decisions that need to be made in your life or about the responses that have to be offered to those expecting and needing a response? These Mount Ararat are real issues. Because decisions have to be made. We are under legitimate pressure. Some things can't be ignored. And all Jesus is teaching us here is while the pressure is real and the threats are looming and the decisions are critical, your spiritual power and authority must be stewarded to the glory and the honor of God. And Jesus gives us such powerful teaching points here. I highlight a couple of them. I'm out your way. First thing this text teaches me is this a key. Don't try to squeeze God into forced decision. 